<clears throat> so how many of you, this is your first time to a meetup? Wow, congratulations and thanks very much for coming out. I find that meetups uh, are a really good way for you to meet other folks in the technical community, people that are working on similar problems and challenges as you and, and coming up with really awesome solutions. So <clears throat> before, before I go into the conversation, into the presentation, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my history um, and sort of how I came to DevOps. I was, uh, I was working at a very large software company uh, that's not true. I was working at a medium-sized software company that was acquired by an, an enormous software company. And um, when that happened, there was this really weird thing. Uh, I was at the smaller company. I was working in IT, and we were building internal applications to make the business better and more efficient. And then we got bought by this ginormous company, uh, a German-based company. And in IT, your role is to save money. And so if we did anything at all that cost money, we had to stop doing it immediately. And it, it really pained me because what we were doing was making the business better, more efficient, making our customers happier. But it cost money to do that. And so our directive was to stop doing all of that right away. So I left that company and I joined the startup world. And I tell you, I had the best job in a startup ever because I was hired by a, a stealth startup. So this is a startup that doesn't want anyone to know about them. But I was hired as the director of customer support. <laughs> An amazing thing about a startup that you cannot talk about and that you aren't selling anything for is you don't have any customers. So being in charge of customer support was brilliant. <laughs> because usually when you're in charge of customer support, what happens is people call you on the phone to tell you they are angry. No one calls support to say thank you, ever. Right? When's the last time you called customer support to thank them? All right, so think about that. Maybe tomorrow while you're at the office, go to your favorite software vendor, call up their support team, and say thank you. Um, but <clears throat> unfortunately, this dream job only lasted about three days, not because the company went under or anything, but because the CEO decided to fire all of the developers that were currently on staff. And so he came to me and he said, Nathan, you are now the most technical person on staff. Uh, so I got this horrified look on my face. I knew this was not going to be good. I was really nervous about what I had just done. I left a job that I didn't really love, but it was clearly like I could be just in my comfort zone the whole time. He saw the look of fear on my face and he said, don't worry. We're not asking you to develop the application. We've hired in a third party to finish building the application. I said, oh, thank goodness. Uh, so why are you here? He said, well, we're going live in six weeks. You need to build us a production infrastructure. They're going to build the app. You build the infrastructure and deploy the app to it. Uh, so then I was very scared. But it was at that moment that I became a system administrator. That very moment. I don't know if you can remember the time that you became a system administrator or the minute that you became a developer. But that was my minute. I became a sysadmin right then. And I was, um, I was, I have to tell you, uh, I was the best sysadmin in the world um, because what I would do, I was actually a very nervous sysadmin and scared, and this made me even better. Because what would happen is I would, I'd go and I'd provision a server from our hosting provider, and then I would go to configure that server, and I would type a command into my SSH window. And then I would get really, really scared because over here on the right-hand side of my keyboard, there's a magic button. That magic button sometimes says enter or return. When you press it, magic things happen on the system. And I was always very afraid of that magic because I didn't understand it. So I, I came up with a brilliant plan. What I would do any time before I hit the magic button is I would copy the command I was about to write and I would paste it into a wiki. And this way, if I ever had to deploy a machine similar to that again, I had all of the commands that I had run in the wiki. And it was brilliant, because the minute I clicked Save on the wiki, I felt, I felt relief. I knew that I could press the magic button, and I could get us back to that right state. Well, what I didn't realize until six months later was also the minute I hit Save on that wiki, that wiki became a lie. It became the obituary of what my infrastructure used to look like. Because over time, I changed the infrastructure. I changed it more. I never went back and updated that wiki. Uh, and the person who had been tutoring me, 
who I was sort of an apprentice to, to learn how to become a sysadmin, he said to me, he said, Nathan, you know what? There's this tool that I've discovered recently. It's called Puppet. There's this other tool that's kind of newer on the scene. It's called Chef. And these tools, you should really look at them because they can automate everything that you do. And I looked him dead in the eye and I said, Tom, I don't have time to automate. Think about that. I don't have time to automate. I'm too busy fighting fires. I can't go and fix things. I can't go and solve these problems. And it literally took me another two years before I finally woke up and saw the light and discovered Chef. And when I discovered Chef, that was when I became a professional sysadmin. So I remember that day also. So what I want to talk to you tonight about is at a pretty high level, sort of what is Chef and what does it mean to manage your infrastructure as code? And then as we go beyond that, uh, if there's time permitting and, and, and interest, what I'd love to do is a demo of Chef and show you sort of how you can use Chef to manage your infrastructure and more importantly, how you can practice continuous delivery. Just make a change on your laptop, run it through a full test pipeline and put it into production, which Man, back in those days was super scary. Actually, it wasn't scary at all because we just did everything in production. So <laughs> we knew it was going to work. So, so does that sound like an okay evening for you for tonight? Yes? Good. Um, that's the evening we have planned, so I'm glad that you nodded your head yes, even if it was just a polite nod. Uh, so every, every business is becoming a software business. One of our customers, uh, Alaska Airlines, the CEO of Alaska Airlines, said to us recently, we are going to become a software company with airplanes. That's what we are. We're no longer an airplane company. We're a software company that has airplanes also. And if you think about your business, I'm sure that you're feeling the same sort of thing. You're turning into a software business. <clears throat> well, over time and sort of in the history of this space, there's always been this trade-off between quality and innovation. I want to be innovative, but I want to also be safe. I need to make sure that what I'm doing is pushing out the right things. These two things fight against each other and keep, you know, you can raise the quality but then really slow down the uh, innovation. So don't deploy anything new. Your quality, like everything should stay stable. But then your customers will all leave. So that's not good. You have to innovate. There are a bunch of things that sort of fight and pu push both of these things down. The first is manual processes. So when I sat there and had to spin up a machine, one machine at a time, and I sat literally looking at uh, my machine, my laptop with eight SSH windows open, I was copying and pasting from one window to the next. Like this manual process is terrible. It's not very good. You have to solve that with automation. When you have legacy systems and tools, this really can slow you down. At the, at the big software company where I was, I was managing some infrastructure. I was running some applications. And I, I had this realization one day, I'm going to need more capacity on this application that I'm running. I shall order another server. And I got approval from my boss. And then it went through the requisition process. And 18 months later, I had another box to add capacity to this application. Now, it's really funny to think that it could take 18 months to get a server in a data center. That's it's a ridiculous thought these days. Um, but maybe some of you are feeling that pain right now. Heck, maybe you have to sit and wait a day or a week. That's too long to wait. We really need dynamic infrastructure for it to push quality and innovation. We have organizational silos in every industry, everywhere you work. We, we fight against each other. We have a lot, uh, objectives that are misaligned and incentives that are misaligned. The developers are told, go and innovate. The operators are told, keep the system stable. So now we're fighting against each other. I don't want your changes. Go away. I want to keep the systems running. We need to increase our cooperation and really start thinking about the systems as a whole. And why are we here? We're here for that customer. We're here to drive the business forward. We're not here so that I can go home and talk about the legacy of this machine that I handcrafted. I don't want to tell stories of this to my children. I want to tell stories of a great business that we built together. You have infrequent large releases. This is how we will be safe. This is how we will make sure that the site stays up. We won't deploy things except twice a year. But then when you do that, those deployments, they're so big and so infrequent. They're error prone. Everything falls apart. It's really, really tough. You need to move to a place of continuous delivery where you're pushing out small changes, learning all the time, and, and really driving that innovation. And of course, we can't forget the regulatory burdens. We all fall under some sort of compliance regime, whether it's PCI 
or what, you know, data quality controls, data, data uh, privacy standards, all of these things impact us. And we have to make sure that as we're moving fast, we can also follow these regulations. So dynamic infrastructure is the first of three or four key ingredients that can help us increase both the quality and the innovation that we have. This really allows us to spin up nodes or spin up infrastructure very, very quickly, spin it up through an API call, let the software create more machines, and then we'll talk about how the software will configure those machines. And that's where we get into this idea of infrastructure as code. So infrastructure as code is saying, it's no longer my job to log onto the machine and configure it. It's now my job to write code that will act on the machine, that will go and configure the machine, that will deploy the applications, and so forth. And so when I think about infrastructure as code, there are a bunch of things that come to mind. First, I must be able to programmatically provision and configure compute instances, nodes, servers, whatever, infrastructure within my environment. The second thing that I think about is it's infrastructure as code. That word code has special meaning. I need to treat my infrastructure code just like any other code. But we should pause for a minute and think about what does that mean? So when I say that you treat your infrastructure code like other code or like any other code base, what does that mean to you? What things come to mind? Versioning, Versioning right? So we're going to version the artifacts that we create. And we're going to take those, uh, the code that we write and we're going to store it in a version control system. Now, if I go back to my early days, I had the most amazing version control system. It was the dot .back version control system. Have you used that one before? Yeah, you copy the file to dot .back. It's really good until you realize that you have to back that file up again. And then what do you call that one? Is it back one? And then you realize, oh no, I'm a computer scientist. The first one should have been back zero because you know zero-based indexes. What are we going to do? Uh, so you know you go through this thing, and then eventually you discover something like subversion, and then your your world has changed. And then someone starts talking to you about Git, and you don't even understand what they're saying. Uh, but then you you fight, you fight it, because subversion works. Why do I need to change out my tooling? And then you change out and you go to Git, and the way that you work, your entire workflow changes. Everything about the way that you work changes. And it, it's, it's this really interesting thing where a tool can have such a dramatic impact on both your workflow and the way you work together with your colleagues. Okay, so treat it as any other code base. We version it. What else do we do with our other code bases? We test it. We have automated tests for our code. That's absolutely correct. And our infrastructure code should be no different than our application code. I can write a unit test for my application code. I should write a unit test for my infrastructure code. I can write an integration test or a functional test for my applications. I should do the same thing for my infrastructure. Good. So we have version control. We have testing. Why do we do these things? What's maybe one other thing? It's a tough one. So for me, code is a continual experiment. In other words, we are always going to refactor our code. If you think now, just go with me on a trip here down your own memory lane. Think back 12 months, maybe 18 months. Think about a piece of code that you wrote 18 months ago. How does that code look? Is that code you want to get up and share with us right now? Is that the pinnacle of your career? That's when I became the best developer ever, when I wrote that code 18 months ago. Or does it kind of feel like shit? Like, that's not very good code. I, I'm kind of ashamed that I wrote that code. Well, of course you are. But it's not because you were terrible back then. But what you are now is you're better at your craft. You have a better understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve. And maybe requirements have changed over that 18 months. And in order for that to happen, the code changes. And as we are refactoring the code over and over again, this is why we need things like automated testing. This is why we need versions and version control systems, so that we can safely, continually refactor that code. And then the, the thing that is really sort of transformative when you start managing your infrastructure as code is that you can reconstruct your entire business with nothing more than compute resources, a backup of your data, and your source code repositories. This is what it takes. So now, when I think about 
all the disaster planning that I did, and well, that's a lie, all of the disaster planning that I avoided back in the day, like, oh my gosh, I can't even, uh, it was so hard to stand it up, I can't even imagine doing it again at some other location. With infrastructure as code, it's easy to do. I just run my code over here. Now I have a full backup. It's pretty incredible stuff, very powerful. And we get all of this, along with this infrastructure as code, it's all about automation. So how do I let the computers do the things that computers are really good at and let me get on to doing those more innovative things or me get on to making sure that our quality is good, that we're serving our customers better? The way that it works in Chef is like this. So if I go all the way over here on the right, I have my infrastructure. These are my nodes, uh, the cloud instances off on Amazon or Azure. Uh, these are servers that are in a data center, what have you. On each one of these machines, there's a little application that's running called the Chef Client. And what happens is the Chef Client, on a, some regular basis, probably every 30 minutes or so, will sort of wake up and ask the Chef server, what policy should I follow? What type of machine should I be in? What does it mean? So maybe I'm a web server. What does it mean to be a web server? Or what does it mean to be a database server? Well, the Chef server stores all of these policies and will send them down to the node, and the node will then make sure that it is following the right state or that it's following the desired state. It matches to the desired state of that node. And so as you're working with Chef, what you're doing is writing these policies, storing them in a version control system, releasing versions of them to the Chef server, and then applying that code in your infrastructure. And this happens on a regular basis. The Chef client runs every 30 minutes. And the best thing about this is because the Chef client is running every 30 minutes, when you have a change in your policy, you write a change to that code, that policy, and you publish it to the Chef server. And now that change is going to be spread out across my infrastructure. The policy has changed. I can easily and automatically spread that out across my infrastructure. Now, one of the worst things about Chef is when you have a policy change and you change that policy and you put it on the Chef server and it spreads out across your infrastructure, but you wrote the wrong policy and you just broke everything. That's a problem and we want to avoid that and we'll talk about some of the strategies, you know, testing, things like that that you do to help that. So here's just an example of what some Chef code looks like. Uh, the way that this works is we have various resources within these. Uh, well, you know, it's Chef, so we write recipes and we put those recipes into cookbooks. So this is a recipe, and we talk about a service, a configuration file, and maybe a directory. The way that Chef works is every 30 minutes, it will evaluate this resource list or this recipe, and it will make sure that each one of these resources are in the desired state. If they're not in the desired state, it will fix them. It will bring them in line with that state, and if they are, it will leave them alone. And so we run this every 30 minutes so that, one, we can push out policy changes. But number two, you all worked on systems. They're not static. They change. And we, we call this configuration drift, right? Things change because some sysadmin logged into a machine and, and fixed a file. Or some external actor, like some application thing, caused a thing to change. Chef will bring it back in line with policy. We then can also test that code. So I talked about this idea of writing automated tests for your code. We can write unit tests for our chef code. We can test them locally on our laptop. So here's just a little bit of test. Like I don't at all expect you to understand this. I just want to show you that there's code here. But you can almost um, understand it. So it converges successfully. Expect the chef run to not raise error. Uh, it installs Apache. Expect the chef run to install the package Apache 2. Like if you've never seen this code before, you could probably read it and understand basically what it's doing. You might not be able to write it after you know this much time with it, but you could certainly read that. We also we talked about versioning. Versioning really is two things. There's your source code repository where you're capturing all of the changes. But then also eventually you get this cookbook to a place where it's releasable. It's a releasable artifact. So you want to have version numbers, and we allow that through the metadata file to say this is version one of this cookbook. Later we'll have version two of this cookbook as our understanding of the infrastructure changes. And then also because I have this all stored in version control, I can say, oh, on this day, 
this was these are the versions of the cookbooks that were running in my production environment. So I could put a, a you know I could stand up a production environment that matches that or a test environment. So our first two components to really change this are dynamic infrastructure and infrastructure as code. So being able to provision things very quickly, managing them all as code. But as it turns out, it's not just the tools. It can't be just the tools. In fact, being a software engineer is as much about knowing how to talk to people and relate to people and understand and empathize with people as it is about being able to write really terse Ruby that is amazing and magic. So let's talk about DevOps. DevOps is, it's a word that gets used a lot and I think it's a word that gets misused a lot. This is my definition of DevOps. DevOps is a cultural and professional movement that's focused on how we build and operate high velocity organizations and it's born from the experiences of its practitioners. Now if we break this down, first it's a cultural and professional movement. DevOps is not a tool. You cannot go out and go to a vendor and buy DevOps. Right? You buy Chef, now you're DevOpping. That's not how it works. You can buy Chef. Well, uh, that would be fine with me, just so we're clear. But that won't mean that you're automatically DevOpsing. Uh, it's focused on how we build and operate high-velocity organizations. Now, this part I, really resonates with me, but also it makes me hate the word DevOps. And here's why. When I hear the word DevOps, and when you hear it, you think development and operations. That's not what DevOps is. It's about building high velocity organizations. It's bigger than just development and operations. Yes, that's where this movement started, getting development and operations working well together. But it's expanded well beyond that. And this, this, this definition and this is such an umbrella term or it's a big tent where everyone has room. I hear people asking, what about QA? What about security? Shouldn't it be DevSecOps? Shouldn't it be DevSec QA ops? And I go to them and I say, well, what about marketing and finance? Like, think about finance just as a, as a small little thing. What, how does DevOps relate to your finance department? Think about moving a traditional application out of a data center and into a cloud. You've changed the dynamics of how you account for that budget, how you account for that spend. Like, try to go to your CFO and say, um, I have all of this capital expenditure on hardware that I purchased last year. I'm not going to do any of that, but I need a bigger budget, right? My operating expense from buying from the cloud. In DevOps, we have to understand this and we bring these people into the tent. And finally, it's born from the experiences of its practitioners. This is why uh, there are so many different definitions of the word DevOps, because the DevOps that Facebook practices is not the same as the DevOps that you practice, is not the same as the DevOps that uh, I practiced at my last job. It's all different. But when we think about it, there are some things that sort of cut across everyone who practices DevOps, some principles of DevOps. And I, I just want to walk through some of the principles very quickly. The first is that we put our people first. DevOps is about the people. And DevOps, we understand and we recognize, we know this through research, that when you have happy people, people that enjoy coming to work, people that are on a mission and understand that mission, those people are going to build better products. And those better products are going to create more customers and, and have a chance at creating a better company. But if you put the product first before the people, you're going to have grumpy workers, grumpy customers. No one's going to want to use it and it's not going to be as successful. So we put our people over our products over companies. In DevOps, we look to many other uh, industries and we try to bring learning and experience from those industries to our industry, to our business. And so we practice things like lean, where we go out and we eliminate any waste in our process, in our workflow, we try to eliminate that. We want to practice continuous improvement. We also prefer pull over push. So in many places that do DevOps, you'll find Kanban boards where they're pulling work through the system and trying to minimize work and process. And it really comes down to small batch and experimentation. What we're here to do is continually learn. We want to learn more about how we all work together to make things more successful. In DevOps, we fail. Failure is a thing that we treat not as an anomaly, not as a thing that has to be avoided at all costs. Failure is a normal operation. It's a way that we can learn. It's not the only way that we learn, but it is one of the ways that we learn. 
And by treating failure as an opportunity to learn, it changes how we approach that. When we have an outage, we don't get together in a room and figure out who do we fire for that outage. Because when you do that, you don't learn anything from that outage. You have to have blameless postmortems and get to the root of the problem. Of course, we practice ubiquitous workflow operation, uh, automation. You cannot eliminate waste if you aren't automating the workflow that you're doing. Again, let your people do the things that are good for people. Let the computers do the things that they're good at. And also in DevOps, we strive for diversity. We want to bring a diverse group of people around the table, a diverse group of people to every problem that we have to serve our customers. We want to have diversity in terms of background, opinion, experience. We need all of this to make the best decisions possible. So the DevOps workflow, the DevOps culture, this is a thing that really is, is frankly, it's changing the way all of us are doing business. And it's something that is so powerful um, and really helps us out. It also gets us to a place where we can actually start thinking about doing continuous delivery. How long does it take for a piece of code, one line of code, to go from code commit into your production environment? And how can you shorten that cycle? That's what continuous delivery is about. And with continuous delivery, we can push things out more quickly in smaller batches so that we can learn faster and we can reduce the risk of those changes. When you push things out every six months, the chances of something in that six months worth of development being broken are very high. And it's also pretty high that it's gonna be the work that was done six months ago. So now you've lost all of the context around what that feature was that you were working on. If we push things out faster, we can resolve them faster and we can learn faster. And of course, security and compliance. We need to be sure that we're being secure and safe at this velocity as we continuously push changes out. And there's been this really interesting trend, I think, in the, in the realm of security professionals. Many security professionals, even today, but you know, this is kind of the journey that they go on. You wanna automate all of this stuff. I can't trust the computers. If it has to be, I have to know that someone has followed the process. Someone has made the changes. That's how I know that it's safe because some person did that. And as a security professional, you will migrate away from that thinking because what you'll see is a vulnerability that gets released and you have to patch that vulnerability. And now if you're doing everything manually, the time it takes to roll that out becomes ridiculous. So you can start to see, you're starting to see the security teams embrace this idea of automation. We can roll out patches faster. Not only that, but we can detect them faster. And when we do it right, we can actually detect those vulnerabilities and those compliance problems at the same time that we're running our unit tests. We can test them in the beginning of the development life cycle, not wait until they're out in production. So if you wanna do continuous delivery, here's the simple diagram that gets you there. Just, just do this, that's all it takes. <clears throat> But honestly, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, continuous delivery, it's about small batches. You're going to increase your near-term volatility. Things are going to change all the time. But over the long term, your risk goes way down. And frankly, your customers want this. Everyone has a smartphone in their pocket right now. Some of you have it in your hand. If you think about how often the applications on your smartphone are being updated, that's what every consumer, every one of your customers, whether your customer is the CEO of your company or your customer is a consumer or another business, we all want this speed. We need that speed. Of course, DevOps isn't a tool, but if you're not using Git, what you should do is not worry about DevOps, not worry about continuous delivery, not worry about Chef, just go learn Git. Just do that, like that is the first thing. Start with a proper version control system. Continuous integration. I, I used to think I practiced continuous integration back in my really smart sysadmin days. So um, in my past, what would happen is if we're gonna build a new feature, the development team would go and cut a feature branch to start work on that new feature. And what I would do on the operations side is spin up a Jenkins infrastructure to test that feature branch. And I said, well, now we're doing continuous integration. Anytime you check in code to that feature branch, I'm gonna run all the tests on it. We're gonna know when something breaks. 
That's not continuous integration though. Continuous integration is about not having long-lived feature branches. I don't need to set up new infrastructure to test that because I'm gonna merge those changes into the master branch all the time, run those tests there. And as an organization, we need to have this belief that we fix the build when it goes red. When the build fails, this stops work. This stops our ability to deliver to our customers. This stops innovation. And here's the thing, fixing the build when it goes red does not mean commenting out the test. Right. But this is another great example of DevOps being more than just development and operations. How many times have you been working on a project that you're getting ready to push out? Maybe the build breaks. It's a sign that you should not push this feature or you should not push this release out into production. But then you have a manager or a CEO who comes in and says, no, we promised this to the customer. We have to get it out right now. It's due today. But all of our systems are telling us not to. Well, just comment those out, push it out. We need to involve everyone in this belief that we fix the bill when it goes red. It's how we maintain quality and our ability to move fast. Uh, we also, in DevOps or in continuous delivery, have to practice what we call the 4I rule. Now, the 4I rule is pretty simple. It states this. No code goes into the production environment without at least four eyes looking at it. Now, I'm very lucky. All the code I write is production ready. I look around the room and I see some other people. What's up, my friends that are wearing glasses? All of our code is production ready the minute we write it. Of course, glasses doesn't help you get out of this rule, uh, which I've had to tell a colleague who came in to the office one day with a pair of glasses that had no lenses in them. So that doesn't, doesn't work that way, Travis. Uh, we write tests. If writing tests are new to you, writing tests can be a really scary thing to do. I've been in way too many conversations, whether they're online or in a room, arguing about what makes a good integration test? What makes a good unit test? You just called that thing an integration test, but it's actually a functional test. Let's argue about the semantics of that. Well, here's what I'll tell you about testing. The test that is good is the test that you wrote and executed when you checked in the code. And you executed it again and again and again. And writing a test is no different than writing any other code. The first test you ever write in your career is going to be shit. And over time, you're going to get better about writing tests. Your tests are going to improve, your, the quality of your test, the comprehensiveness of your tests. My advice to you is to write one test and execute it all the time. And then write another test and execute it all the time. If you find yourself in a code base with no tests, start writing tests. Start writing tests. Don't say, I'm not touching this code base until I go over here for six months and write a full test suite that covers everything. Don't do that. Start writing your tests now. Make that a practice. There's one path for change. If you want to do continuous delivery properly, there must be one path for change through your organization. The way that any change moves is always fixed. And Remember, your applications are code and your infrastructure is code. And the way that they both change through to your production environment, they follow the same pipeline. They follow the same steps along that pipeline. Uh, I guess I needed to remind you that there's one path for change. So I put the slide in twice. There's a little bit of irony to that, right? This one too, it seems. All right. So what, what are the rewards? When we adopt continuous delivery, when we adopt these DevOps practices, like it all sounds good, but is it worth it? Is there business impact? Yes, there is. So through a bunch of research, uh, we've discovered, or actually not we, uh, my colleague, Dr. Nicole Horsgren, has done a ton of research on DevOps for years. Uh, we find more deployments, we ship faster, we decrease the mean time to recovery when there are outages. We've shown through research that there are more profits, market share, and productivity at these companies. It's not just good for us, the people. It does make better companies. All right. What I would love to do, if, if uh, I don't even know how we're doing on time, but I would love to show you a little demo. 
Are you guys up for that? A little demo of some Chef workflow? All right. I'm going to show you. A, it's a very simple demo. It's just this. Um, but I'm going to walk you through this uh, a little bit. So let's do some demo time here. So let me just set up the demo where we are. Uh, let's see. I need a browser. Here we go. OK. We're going to do. Uh, we're actually going to do two things in this demo. Let me just launch one other site here. There we go. All right. So what I want to start with is I want to just show you this web page. This is a pretty simple web page. It was built by Chef. And so let's take a look at the recipe that builds this page. It is over here. Let me look at. The recipe defaults. Uh, I'll update you later. And let's see. OK, only a few of you have ever used Chef. So I assume that only a few of you have ever seen any Chef. So I'm just going to walk through this. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, hopefully it is kind of self-explanatory. So I'm in a cookbook. I'm in a recipe called the default recipe. And this is what it does. The first thing is is, is, uh, is it includes another recipe. And the other recipe is called install Apache. So I'm not going to show you that recipe, but I bet you can guess what it does. It's going to install Apache on the node where this runs. It's then going to write out a configuration file using a template for the Apache web server. So it's going to write a file to etsy apache 2 httpd.conf. If you how many of you have ever configured Apache before? Okay, a couple of you and the rest, it doesn't really matter. I don't you don't need to know much about Apache. It's a web server. It has a configuration file. We manage it here. That's enough. Uh, we grab a tarball from an S3 bucket and we store it at this local path. So there's a remote file we're going to store it at this path tarball, which is a file cache. We're going to call it webfilestar.gz. We go out to S3. We download that thing. We then write out the home page for our website. It's, again, another template, var www.index.html. And then our final step in this recipe is to extract the web files. So we take that tarball that we had, and we explode it within our directory. And so now, once I've done that, you should be able to go to our browser, and you see that home page. And so that home page is over here. That home page is over here. And the thing I want us to look at is this first line here, hello, Chef Software. What we're going to do is say the business just came to us and said, it's great that you're saying hello to Chef Software. Nathan, as it turns out, you're in NCR's office tonight. Maybe you should greet them instead. So we need you to update the web page. We need you to update the website. So I'm going to go ahead and walk through exactly how I'm going to do that. So let's go over here again back to my editor. The first thing I'm going to do is I want to say, listen, this is a cookbook. This cookbook has a version number. It's 0 0.1.29. I'm starting a new release for this cookbook. It's a new version. So what I should do is bump the version here. I'm going to change it to 0 0.1.30. And then I'm going to save it. And then I'm going to say to myself, oh, no, I just saved a thing, and I need to put that into version control. But what's going on with my version control? I think I'm still on the master branch. And let's see. Let's see if I can bump this up here. Uh, I cannot. Uh, okay, so. Can you kind of see that in the back a little bit OK? Yeah, OK. So I'm here in that folder. I can see if I do a git status that I have one file change, that metadata that I just changed. Before I do anything else, I want to create a short-lived short branch. So I'm just going to do a git checkout dash b uh, update homepage. 
All right, so I'm in a new branch now. I've safely updated my metadata.rb to bump the version. Let's look at this index.html.erb. This is the template that draws out the home page. And we know that somewhere in this template, we should find that hello chef software. Here it is on line 58, except it doesn't say hello chef software. It says hello node site dbaz company name. So this is a variable. It's just an attribute that's actually stored as part of the cookbook. So let me just pull up these attributes here on the cookbook, and you'll see that I have site dbaz company name is set to Chef Software Inc. So let's go ahead and change that here. I'm going to change that to NCR and save that. Okay, so I have a change that I'm ready to sort of run through the system and get it deployed out to production. But before I do that, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Like that's one change. That's a change I should test and push out to production. But I know there's something else wrong here. And I want to show you the something else wrong. And we're going to cheat and we're going to put two changes through the pipeline at the same time. Uh, it'll just make us, the demo go a little bit faster. So let me come back over here. Uh, actually, let me come back to this slide for a second. full screen mode. There we go. And what I want to do, you remember that crazy diagram? We're going to just break it down from the left to the right. On the left hand side, we're talking here about an assessment with chef compliance. So we talk about this idea of moving fast and, and following our regulatory compliance and, and staying compliant with our infrastructure is an important thing for us to do. So I'm actually going to show you this, uh, this newer thing from Chef. It's called the Chef Compliance Server. So I have that over here. Let me log in. And so from this server, I can actually go out and scan infrastructure that's currently running. So I'm going to pick uh, this node here, the CAD acceptance node. And I'm going to run a scan against it. And the scan I'm going to run is just a web server check because I know it's running this web server. So I want to make sure that it's following our compliance controls. So I'll scan this now, and let's see what happens. And so what's happening here is the Chef compliance server has a number of compliance profiles that it's going to use to scan that remote node. So via SSH, it's just logged into that host, has executed a bunch of scans, and it has found one critical vulnerability. And so I can scroll down here and sort of read a little bit about this vulnerability. It says here that Apache should not allow directories to be indexed. It's a little bit unsafe to run your web server where if someone goes to a, a directory on the web server and there's no index.html, it just shows all the contents of that. So um, we should not allow options indexes in our configuration file. Now I can see what this compliance rule, I can see actually how it was implemented over here. If I expand this, this looks very similar to some of the test frameworks that you might have seen before. So this code actually is written in a language called InSpec. InSpec is an open source language that allows you to create these sort of compliance controls. So I have here a rule, it's called basic one. It has an impact title and description, and then it has a test. So the test here is that we describe a file, Etsy Apache 2 httpd.conf. Its content should not match options indexes. So my configuration file allows this setting, which is not a very safe way to run Apache. The nice thing about this is in addition to that test, I also get this title and description so that as the compliance person, I can actually provide to my operators and to my developers some reasons for why you shouldn't do that or tell them what they need to change. Okay, with this knowledge in mind, we know that we have a critical error. It's failing because indexes are turned on. Let's go back into the code and see where that's set up. If you'll recall from the recipe, one of the first resources that we had was a template for our HTTPD conf. So this is what configures our web server. So if I come in here into that template, I can see, sure enough, here on line 12, that options indexes is turned on. 
So I'm going to remove indexes so that that is no longer in my configuration. Now, removing that from my configuration could potentially break something about my website. So I want to make sure that I test this really well. So let me just do some quick local testing on that. The way that I can do some local testing, so uh, let me just take a look here, get status. You have to spell things properly. Computers are really rude like that, you know. <laughs> it should, should have known what I meant. Okay, so I can see that I've modified three files, my attributes file, my metadata, and the uh, Apache configuration, the site dbass.erb. Well, I want to go ahead and test this locally. I want to make sure that it's going to be OK. The best way for me, I mean, I have a bunch of ways that I can do that. Uh, this is a cookbook. So a cookbook has, uh, or in Chef, we have a tool that will do linting, linting of our cookbooks. So like if you've written Java, maybe a J, or JavaScript, maybe like JS lint, it will look at the code to make sure that it's following sort of best practices. So we have this tool called Food Critic, of course. <laughs> So I can run food critic on this directory, and I see that there are no errors in it. It's following all of the right, like proper rules, so that's good. Another thing that I can do, though, I have this tool called Test Kitchen. And what Test Kitchen allows me to do is actually spin up from my local workstation, spin up a virtual machine, take this code that I've just written, put it onto that virtual machine, and execute it. And then I can inspect that to make sure that everything looks good. So I'm just going to run this command, kitchen converge. And just before I do so, I want to point out that this is an instance's default EC2 Ubuntu 1404. So what's going to happen, what we've already done, uh, oh, it says not created. So this might take a minute. We might not watch all of this. But kitchen converge is going to do this. From this workstation, it's going to go out to EC2 and create a new virtual machine. It's going to get a new cloud instance. It's then going to install Chef on that cloud instance, run my cookbook, and then execute some tests to make sure that all of my tests are continuing to pass on this test instance. So just to remind us where we are, and we'll come back to this in a minute, <clears throat> we're doing this compliance scan. We found a vulnerability. So we're running compliance, we found a vulnerability, and now we want to remediate that vulnerability. And the way we remediate it or fix that vulnerability is by doing some local development. And once I've done that local development, I've changed the, the options uh, for my Apache configuration, I need to test everything. That may have broken my website by pulling that out. I'm not sure. I want to know that before I go into production. So I've modeled out that change, and I'm now testing it. And after I'm done with my tests and I see that it's working locally, I'm then ready to take that change and submit it to, oh boy. Oh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no worries. No worries at all. So now what I'm ready to do is take this change and I want to collaborate with the rest of my team and push this change through a pipeline. And for that, we're going to utilize Chef Delivery. So let's take a look and see how that test is coming along. And even if it's not done, we'll start talking about uh, delivery here. Uh, so what's happening here, it, it spawned that image. Uh, it's right now installing the Chef client. And when that's done, it's going to put the cookbooks up. Oh, it's you're doing it nice and fast. It's putting my cookbooks up there. And now it is installing or executing all of the policy. So it's going to install Apache on that thing. It's going to download that uh, gzip file. It's going to expand it, write out my index, and all of that. We're going to let that go for a minute. And let's talk about what we're going to do to get this change through to production. We're going to think about some of those practices and rules, like the 4i rule and continuous integration. How do we take those and actually embody and embed those practices into our tool? How do we put those into our pipeline? And the way that we do that is by using Chef Delivery. So Chef Delivery gives us this unified pipeline for all of the changes that we need to make, whether it's infrastructure changes or application changes. And as I said earlier, the, the way that change moves through your organization should be fixed. 
And this is how we've fixed it. Uh, we start with a verify, well, we start with a change. You submit that change, and that change then gets verified. Once it's verified, it will go through these stages. An approval stage, we'll build an artifact, it will then go through some acceptance. Once it's accepted, we will deliver that change through a union, rehearsal, and delivered environment. So when I submit the change, which I'll do in just a second, what's going to happen in this verify stage are three different phases. The delivery server will run a lint check to make sure the code is good. It will run a syntax check, and then it will run my unit tests. Once all three of these have passed, this piece, this part of my pipeline, or this change in my pipeline, will move on to the approval stage. So let's just look at exactly how we do that, because the test, the local test should be done right about now. Let's see how we're doing. Ah, looks good. So. Uh, my kitchen converge finished, uh, and then I ran an audit phase. Uh, so I validated the Apache configuration. I ensured directory listing is not allowed. I didn't run this before, so you couldn't see it fail before. We only saw the compliance scan fail before, but that test is passing. Now the interesting and cool thing about this is I took that compliance scan test, and I actually have baked it into my development workflow. So I can validate that in development not wait until it gets to production. All of these things are good, uh, so I'm ready to submit this change. So to submit the change, of course, the first thing I'm going to do is git commit. And I have to not talk while I type, or else the typing gets really hard. All right, so I'm going to update the home page and fix the indexes. So I now am on this update the home page branch. I'm on a clean branch now. Everything's been submitted or has been committed to my repository. I'm ready to take this change and to submit it for review. To do so, I have another command line utility that comes as part of Chef Delivery. It's called Delivery. So I'm going to say Delivery Review. This takes this change and submits it to the delivery server to go through our review process. And as it does so, it opens up the web user interface for the delivery server. Now, Chef Delivery has a couple of great things about it. First, it has this pipeline of verify, approve, build, acceptance, deliver, union, rehearsal, and delivered. And then in addition to that, it allows us to really visualize where is the change through this pipeline. Where's the change in the middle of this pipeline? What phase is it at? And so forth. So we can see here that we have one change that is currently running through the verify stage. Oh, the syntax just completed, so it has a check mark here. I can actually expand syntax and see like what was going on here. So my syntax test ran a knife cookbook test against that, and it made sure that the syntax was good. So I can close that out. We can see how the other two are going. My unit test is passed, my lint test is passed, my syntax test is passed. So I've now completed the verify stage. It's now ready for approval. This is the first of our uh, two human gates. So this is the point where the 4i rule comes into play. So now uh, I'm just going to switch hats really quick. I've logged in as another user who didn't just submit that change, and I'm going to come over here and click review. Well, directly within the uh, delivery user interface, I can see what are the changes. So I can click on attributes default, and I can get a view of what's changed. So it changed from Chef Software to NCR. I can look at the next file and see that it went from 129 to 130, and that I've updated the indexes from options indexes was turned on to we turned it off. Now, as part of this review, the other thing that I can do is, sorry, let me go here. I can leave comments about this review. Looks good to me. Ship it. And then add a comment on this review. And we see that emoji are supported, so that's fun. When you do code reviews, they're always better with emoji. Uh, in fact, um, I could put, paste a YouTube video in here, and it would play the YouTube video. Again, makes code reviews more fun. But now I'm ready to approve. And when I click this Approve button, it's going to just make me confirm. 
And I'll read this to you. Are you sure you want to approve this change? After approval, this change will be merged to master. So as soon as I click this confirm button, I'm doing continuous integration. This change is merged right back into the master branch and it moves on to the build phase. So let's take a look at that first in the code. If I'm back here in my repository, if I do a git checkout master, I can do a git pull and we're going to see that some changes come down to the attributes, the metadata, and that template. And if I do a git log, we'll see exactly the changes that I just submitted. So we have um, here, update the home page and fix the indexes. That's what I just did from the command line. And then here's the reviewed code, the, git, the merge that gets put back into the master branch. Now, it's moved on to the build phase. So from here, what's going to happen is we're going to run another series of phases in the build stage. We're going to run lint, syntax, unit, security, quality, and then we will publish this thing that we've built. But wait a minute. We just ran lint, syntax, and unit. Why are we running them again? They clearly just passed on this change when it was in the verify stage. Why do we need to run them again here in the build phase? Because I've done a merge. That's right. Remember, this verify stage happened against that branch. As soon as I hit approve, those changes got merged into master. There may have been other changes that were sitting and waiting and got approved ahead of mine. That, so we want to make sure that the merge happened cleanly and that I haven't changed anything else or there haven't been other side effects. So I run the lint syntax and unit. Then I run a security and a quality test on that. And then finally, I publish an artifact. So what we have is a cookbook. A cookbook has a version number associated with it. So our version is 0.1.30. So we're going to take that cookbook and actually publish it up to the chef server. And so now the chef server will have both the 129 version and the 130 version. And then we move on to our acceptance phase. And in our acceptance phase, we have these stages. Uh, sorry, our acceptance stage, we have these phases. The first is a provision phase. And what this will do is say, we have a change. We need to take this change and put it onto some infrastructure so that we can actually see it running. The unit tests are very helpful for me, but I want to put this change onto real infrastructure and see it in action. So the provision phase will go off and provision an environment for me. Now, uh, in this particular case, the environment already exists, but Chef is smart enough, just like it knows, don't change a thing if it's already in its state. If this environment already exists, I don't need to provision a new server. But if it didn't exist, it would provision it. The next thing it will do is deploy this change. So what does it mean to deploy a change? Well, in the case of a cookbook, it means to execute that cookbook. So run that version of the cookbook on that node. But if you were deploying a .NET app, that's not what you would do. You wouldn't run Chef Client necessarily, or you wouldn't care about the cookbook. You would deploy the app in your own way. Or if you're running a Java app, maybe you've just publish the jar and you're going to grab that jar, drop it into your container, maybe restart the container. I don't know what deploy means for you, but it's the step that you go through here. And from there, you'll run your smoke tests and your functional tests as well. So as I mentioned, the delivery UI gives us a good way to sort of visualize change as it moves through our pipeline. Let's take a quick look at that. So here we see that it's gone through verify and approval. It's gone through the build phase and the acceptance phase. Uh, so it's currently sitting in acceptance. And you can see here that provision, deploy, smoke, and functional have all completed. Now, for the sake of sort of speeding this up a little bit, I want to show you one thing. On the compliance server, the thing that I checked, if you'll remember, you might not remember, but I said, I'm going to check the CAD acceptance node. So that's the acceptance environment that I've just deployed this code to. So if that's working properly, that constraint or that failure on my control should be passing now. So I'm going to select that. I'm going to go ahead and scan it. I'm just going to do the admin web server check again. And it's going to, again, it's going to, from here, it's going to SSH into that machine, execute those controls. And we see that we have, um, we have no errors. We have one test, and it is compliant. So I can see that that's fixed. 
Now the other thing I want to do is make sure that the home page was updated. So here in this tab up here it says acceptance CAD chef. If I go here without refreshing the page it says hello chef software Inc. And then if I refresh the page not like that. If I refresh the page it now says hello NCR. So now what's happening is I'm the product owner or I'm the compliance officer and I want to come in and make sure that the change you made was the right change. So I'm the product owner. Good job. This is NCR. You got that right. The compliance officer ran the scan against the acceptance environment. It's now passing. This feels like a change that we're ready to deliver. So let's uh, talk about how we do that. So we now have a person that needs to come along and say, are we ready to ship this? Is this a thing that we want to ship? This is the second of our two human gates. Our first human gate, we were asking, Does the software, was the code written well? Did you write good software? This is usually an engineer's job, a fellow engineer's job to do that code review. But now we're bringing in the business, the product owner, maybe the customer, depending. Are we ready to ship this? Is this the thing we're ready to ship out? We think it is, so we're going to hit the deliver button. I'm just going to go hit that button really quickly, and then we'll come back and talk about what happens during those stages. Oh, and just uh, for to show everyone what's going on here, these are going to go through union and rehearsal, and then into delivered. And so if I go to the union stage, and I'm going to refresh this page, except not like that. If I refresh this page, it still says, hello, Chef Software. And of course, the same for my rehearsal environment. It still says, hello, Chef Software. OK. So uh, oh, here I am uh, in a different tab looking at the delivery pipeline. But this is the dashboard. Uh, and I can see I have one active change right now, the site DBATS. These are previous changes that were already delivered. But I can see exactly where this change is. It's ready to, for someone to mash the deliver button. Uh, and I was over here, so I can see it. My acceptance has completed the provision, the deploy, the smoke, and the functional. I'm ready to go. I'm going to press deliver. And it's going to say, hey, by the way, when you do this, we are pushing this out all the way to your delivered environment. Here are the changes that are going to be included. Are you sure? I'm going to go ahead and confirm that. So it says, success, your change has now been delivered. And it's moving on to my union environment. We can watch this here. I'm just going to speed us up a little bit. Uh, the way that we speed us up as we look at slides. And what's going to happen in our union environment is we're going to provision hardware if it doesn't exist, or provision additional hardware if that's what's required. We're going to deploy our change. We'll run the smoke tests and the functional tests. If all of this passes and all of it works, we'll move on to the rehearsal environment where we're going to do the same thing, provision, deploy, smoke, and functional. And then finally, it gets into our delivered environment. It gets to our customers. And once it gets to our customers, in that stage, we're going to run those same phases, provision, deploy, smoke, and functional. So this is the unified shape of our pipeline. This is what our change is. These are the stages and phases that every change will follow as it moves through our environment. And so we've gone from assessing what needs to change. We've built and modeled that change and tested it locally. We've worked with the rest of our team to actually continuously deliver that out all the way through to our target workloads or our production environment. Uh, so let's just take a quick look back here and see how that change is moving through our pipeline. Looks like Union is still running. So the provision of Union is done. The deploy of Union is done. We skipped the smoke part of Union, and we're on to functional. Oh, it just passed. So now it's going to head over to the rehearsal environment next, and we'll watch this auto update. So this tool, this tooling, is a thing that we've looked around the industry and talked about best practices. We talk about the way that you do DevOps and some of those practices that I talked about. And we want to make those practices easy. We want to make the right thing the easy thing to do. We want to make this the easiest, easiest path possible to get your changes to, through to production. And so that's what we built here into this tool. So um, really, that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. We can watch this continue to move from the rehearsal environment off to the delivered environment. Uh, but I think that you'll find Chef is really uh, an exciting set of functionality, provides some really great tooling that can help you and your team 
actually start to embrace these ideas of de DevOps and continuous delivery and start working in those ways. And with that, I'd love to open up the floor to any questions that I can answer for you. We'll go here, and then we'll come to you. Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is Rain, uh, and uh, I'm curious. Uh, I'm right now in Topic Shop, so yep. the, the other side of the world. Sure. And, uh, uh, this was amazing. What I'm curious about is when you go to when I'm to spin up the environment, uh, I can see GitHub behind it most likely. Uh, you see uh, Amazon and uh, you have the tool set. Uh, let's say that I want to build one web server. Yes. With basic tool set available, with account, GitHub, and such. How long to submit events which you need it will take all this to fit together yes. in the perfect one server? To perfect visual, okay, so let me just make sure I understand the question. <laughs> uh, I have some people who have never touched Chef before, never done anything with it, and I want them to be able to stand up a simple web server, mm -hmm. uh, following these practices, using Chef. Mm -hmm. uh, how long is that going to take them? How long is it going to take them to learn how to do that and mm -hmm. to actually do that in practice? Yeah. Uh, it's a very easy answer. It depends. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I will. I will talk a little bit more about that. So, um, so let's talk about the, the skills that you're going to need to have. Uh, so, of course, you're going to want to know version control system. You're going to want to know some Git. Uh, you, you're going to have to learn the Chef language. Now, Chef is written in Ruby. So as you're writing recipes, you're writing Ruby. But I showed you a bunch of Ruby tonight, and you could read all of it, I'm guessing. Um, and, and even if you couldn't, you wouldn't admit it now. Right? So uh, you have to learn a little bit of Ruby, but you do not need to be a Ruby expert. Uh, it also is really important that you understand how to stand up a web server and deploy it. As it turns out, if you go and try to automate something that you don't understand, that leads to yeah, that leads to some things that are really really bad, right? Uh, so all that told, um, the the other part of the, the it depends piece is how are they going to learn? Because the 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 way that they could do it is they could go to learnchef.com, they could do, go through some videos or or their own tutorials, and within a week. No problem. You could you could accomplish that task. You could come to a training class that Chef offers, whether it's an online training class or, or one of us could come to your office. You'd be done with that in a day, right? Uh, and so it's really going to vary. And of course, the complexity of the web server changes things. And and then there's also the question of: Are you going to stand up a full pipeline, or do you just want to? I just wanted to play a web server. Like I just want to play with it some. You probably don't need a full pipeline to actually just do something. As you move into a production environment, like you're doing it for real, yes, you're going to want a full pipeline. Yeah. yeah. So with the full pipeline, counting, I know Git, I know Ruby, yeah. I know lots of server server and so on. Absolutely. Rough estimate. Uh, yeah. I'm talking about a week or talking about three weeks. I would say if, if we're going from zero to you're deploying your web server like this, mm -hmm. I would like, I would give yourself, with help from us, we could get that done. You'd be done in five days. On your own, it's going to take a little bit longer than that. Sure. But having a guide, that's, and what I mean with us, I mean we're in the room with you and we're helping you through the process. Right? Like any other technology, right? you're learning a new language, you're learning a new way to think about things. The fact that you're a puppet shop gives you a little bit of an advantage because uh, honestly, when I went from managing my infrastructure by hand, the first place I went was Puppet. And it took me a long time to learn Puppet, but once I understood it, I became very efficient. And then when I moved from Puppet to Chef, I already had all that basic knowledge of what does it mean to manage infrastructure as code. Because managing infrastructure as code, as you know, is very different than logging in and doing everything by hand. Great, thanks. Yes? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I would like to thank you for the product. I've been using it for half a year. It's uh, I'd like to ask uh, about the relationship between uh, chef and uh, containers, uh, especially especially the new development uh, upon uh, you know these containers and clusters like Kubernetes and, yes. uh, and, and Docker Swarm, because it seems to me that you, uh, your your technology allows allows you to define 
this uh, this pin goes to this server, and from uh, this distance I have to this new technologies. It seems like uh, the clusters allows allows you to uh, do this stuff automatically. Right. So so are you afraid or? Yeah, what, sure. What, what sure, sure. So uh, the question is really around Chef and containers, and specifically around uh, great new clustering technology that's coming out around containers like Kubernetes and Mesosphere and all of these things that like bring containers together, Docker Swarm. Uh, so here's kind of my take <coughs> on that. Number one, containers are the future. Containers are there's there's no question about it. Containers are going to have at least as dramatic impact on the way that we do things as cloud did, right? So that is absolutely true. The thing that containers, the thing that's so beautiful about containers is the developer's workflow experience, right? I can, at my laptop, become productive very quickly without needing to know a whole lot about infrastructure. The challenge, I think, becomes when we move into the production environment. The things like Kubernetes and Mesosphere and all of these things that are getting containers to talk together and understanding how and where they scale, there's, it's, it's a complex problem. And the tools are very young, right? They're just getting there. The other thing I will say, though, about containers, if you think about this, like how do you mitigate some of that fear? How do you make things safer for you while you're using containers and being safe? <coughs> this, I showed you a cookbook moving through here. But there's nothing to say that the thing that you submitted to verify, that may have been a change to a Docker file. So how do we get that Docker file into production in a safe way? Well, you want someone to verify and approve that the, Docker, the change you made to that Docker file is good. And then maybe you want to build a Docker image and run some tests against it. You want to deploy that artifact somewhere and have it go through an acceptance phase where then someone, the product owner, can say, yeah, it's the right thing. Let's push that to production. So you can absolutely use this same workflow, these same stages and phases, to manage the deployment of Docker. The other thing, of course, is like you want to set up a Kubernetes cluster. Well, how do you set up a Kubernetes cluster? Well, we could start with Chef. Like we could write Chef recipes to stand up that Kubernetes cluster. We could put that into a pipeline. We could put your Docker files through a pipeline. So I think, uh, frankly, I love containers and the relationship with Chef and containers, like. We're kind of infatuated with each other now, and it's going to get better. Yeah. You bet. So, well, actually, the whole topology of your environment we have is a lot of the model because we don't very much use the kind of topology where you just provision mm -hmm. to this. Right. So it's in integrated some other components like. Yeah, like Kubernetes or Terraform or something like that, yeah. right? Right. So, the question there is like, what defines the topology? And there's this. Uh, let me just show you a, a quick thing here. Um, so the way that this pipeline actually is defined is itself through a cookbook. So the pipeline that I'm using in this demo uses a cookbook called the Delivery Truck. If we look at the recipes in the delivery truck, you're going to see names that are very familiar from tonight. You're going to see names like provision, quality, security, smoke, syntax, unit. Each one of those phases through the pipeline is actually just a recipe. And so this is what makes it possible for us to say, you can deploy your cookbooks through this pipeline, but you can also deploy your .NET apps through your Rails apps through, your Java apps through, your Docker containers through. But what you would do is in the unit test or the unit recipe as an example, like this is what we do. We look for each one of the changed cookbooks and we execute the R spec. We execute chef spec against those cookbooks. Well, you wouldn't look for that. You'd look for each one of the changed Docker files and you'd run the unit tests against those Docker files or the lint tests against those Docker files, right? And then when it comes specifically to the topology, there's the provision recipe here. And yes, we are using Chef provisioning to do this. So we have a helper provision. We uh, get the acceptance environment, get the uh, environments. We build out the nodes in that stage. And so the way that we define that topology is through code. 
It's through recipes. It's through searches against the chef servers. So as an example, you may have a naming convention for your nodes, or you may say that these uh, nodes have the union role associated with them, or the union environment. And adding another node to the union environment makes that node part of union. Yeah. So provisioning is what we're using today. Could you bake in something else? Of course. It's, it's chef. Yeah. You bet. Yes? Sure. So the question there is I have a company that's moved to Amazon and we want to go full automated. What do we what do we pick? Like I could do everything in cloud formation. I could do things with CloudFormation and OpsWorks. I could do it all with Chef. Uh, and I'm going to give you the same answer I gave to the first question. <laughs> it depends. But I will talk about each one of those a little bit, right? So um, Amazon is like, things like CloudFormation are amazing. They're very powerful and very fast, right? If what I'm doing is spinning up a pre-baked AMI, it comes up like that. If I had to go from nothing to provisioning a full node, and configuring it with just using Chef. If it's not an AMI, if it's like a base AMI to get to a fully provisioned database server, it's going to take some time. There are trade-offs with each one of those, right? If if you have that time and, and can plan out the capacity, great, Chef is good for you. If there are components where you can't do that, where you need really rapid spin up and spin down, cloud formation might be better with some baked AMIs. But then I would say what you should do is use Chef to bake those AMIs, right? You can actually take those AMIs, again, and put them through a delivery workflow, right? So that this AMI gets built, it gets all of the functional and integration tests, and when we're happy with it, we deploy that new AMI. And part of that deploy process might actually be update your cloud formation template so that it starts using this new AMI in your environment. So I think cloud formation is very, very strong. I think it's a, it's a really interesting thing that you can use. But it's not, of course, it's not the only way to provision and spin up nodes in Amazon. You have many other solutions like Chef Provisioning, like HashiCorp's Terraform. All of these things can be used to work with that. So I, I really think it comes down to this. What are the tools that your team is most comfortable using? Where do you have the expertise? And then also, honestly, is, is Amazon where you want to be, right? So saying what we're doing is we're going all in on cloud formation, that's great if you're going all in on Amazon. And if you want to move off of Amazon because for whatever reason, I can't even, I, I don't know what your reasons might be. But the more uh, cloud formation you have baked in, the more you have to change when you move away. Now, to be fair, it's not just the cloud formation that's going to keep you in Amazon, right? The more data you put into any cloud, there's this concept of data gravity, right? You put the data into a thing, it gets heavier and heavier, harder to move out of that thing, right? So cloud formation might have this feel of vendor lock-in. It's not the only vendor lock-in. Vendor lock-in, like it happens all the time. And it's not just because of the one service that you picked from Amazon. Yes. Yes, so let me compare OpsWorks with Chef. So OpsWorks um, is, if you're not familiar with OpsWorks, OpsWorks is a solution uh, that Amazon also offers. You know, they have all kinds of services, RDS, where you get database as a service. OpsWorks is essentially Chef as a service. So with OpsWorks, what uh, Amazon has done is they've taken, taken essentially the Chef server, and they're running that for you. They've given you a set of cookbooks that you can use out of the box or you can upload your own custom cookbooks. And within OpsWorks, you can define stacks that are applications, and you can define application lifecycle events. And what happens during each one of those events, say the event is provision a new server, a certain subset of your chef recipes will, will run then. Deploy new code, another subset of your chef recipes will run at that time. The, the biggest challenge I find with OpsWorks, honestly, is that it, it's another layer of abstraction on top of Chef. And sometimes uh, the things that feel right based on the way OpsWorks are set up
can lead to problems. For example, when you run just a subset of your, your policy at provision time, and you run another piece of your policy at deployment time, what happens if there has been configuration drift and some of your policies that were only executed at provision time? What if something about the environment has changed? How do you re get those to play like without spinning up new stuff? So there are trade-offs like with every technology decision. Uh, I, you know, find the tools that are right for you. The best way to know, honestly, do some experimenting. Like, ask yourself that question and give yourself a week. I have this simple application or a complex application, and I want to be able to spin it up, spin it down, scale it in, scale it out in Amazon. I'm going to take a week, or I'm going to take two weeks, and I'm going to try three different options. I'll do Terraform, I'll do Opsworks, I'll do Traditional Chef. The only way that you're going to be able to answer that question is to go and use those tools. Also, just use Chef. I mean, you know, I work at Chef. That's what I'm going to tell you. Just use Chef. Just Chef all the way. That's all that matters. It'll solve all of your problems. It'll solve all of your problems. And it's Chef, so yes, it can make you a sandwich. <laughs> yes? Uh, does Chef uh, support uh, having a local virtual machine or a local virtual machine like optimization? For example, I have a team of several developers, and I have one of them have all the same environment on their tool. Yes. Like set up things is built here or or... Right. So uh, let me just make sure I understand the question. You have like five different developers. You want to make sure that all of their laptops are the I, same? I lost my laptop. Yeah. yeah, you've lost your laptop. So now how do I, I want to get back to a good state. Yes. Spend one day. Yes. So you can absolutely use Chef to manage. Uh, you can use Chef to manage basically uh, just about any operating system. So. I, have, I don't do it, but I do have colleagues that manage their entire Mac configuration with the Chef recipes. Uh, you could do the same with Windows. Uh, you could manage just pieces of it. Like my Chef development environment is managed with the Chef recipe. What tools should I use to, to run this uh, AC to manage? You'll use Chef to run the recipes on your local machine. So should I follow Chef Chef server? Oh, no. So you wouldn't. Uh, it, so, sorry. It depends. Uh, but here's, here's probably the easiest way to get your local machine set up. You will have a, a shared Git repository of the recipes that you use for local development. You will, on your local machine, you will install Chef. Of course, it's, it's hard to get Chef to install Chef if Chef isn't already installed, right? But once it's there, it can do the upgrades and things for you. But So you'll have to install Chef, um, but then Chef, you can write a recipe that can check out from that Git repository and then execute those recipes. And, and that's how you do it. And it'll just run locally. It doesn't have to go to a server. It can just pull from a Git repository. Another thing that I'll show you really quickly, um, oh. So let me show you another thing over here on uh, GitHub. Do you know Nordstrom here? You've probably never heard of Nordstrom, right? Nordstrom is a big retailer, a department store in the US. They are also a software company, as it turns out. So Nordstrom has, uh, their, as it says there, they're headquartered in Seattle. But they do a lot of stuff with Chef. Uh, and one of the things that they've written is a uh, a script slash recipe called Chef DK Bootstrap. And what this will do, I'll just scroll down to uh, the README. As it says on the tin, it will set up your laptop for Chef development in minutes. And so what they do when they have a new person on their team who's going to start doing Chef, they say, check out this repo, run this command. And if you're running on Windows or running on Mac, it will install Git, it will install VirtualBox, it will install Vagrant, it will install Chef. It will install the Atom text editor. So it gets all of these things set up and configured. Of course, on Windows, it will install Putty, because you're probably going to need to SSH somewhere. On a Mac, it needn't do that, because well, you know, it has proper tooling out of the box. Um, yeah, uh, it will do PowerShell stuff for it, like does all of the things for you. So you can literally like download this thing, kick off the script, go have a coffee, come back, and now you're, you're productive and ready to do Chef. Maybe time for one more question. 
Uh, yes. May I have two? Yeah, sure. <laughs> now you have three. Okay. Uh, first, uh, the Azure is some kind of uh, provides Azure some kind of uh, something similar to chat. Does uh, Azure? It, chat. Yeah. And the, the second question: How to uh, con uh, convince my customer to do uh, deploy often? Because they hate to do uh, deploys. Uh, we are ready to do deploys every week, but yes. they want to do deploy every every year. Yeah, every year sounds great. Every year sounds great. Uh, okay, first bit of advice, fire your customer. Uh, oh, no, 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 maybe that's not going to work either. I have really terrible advice. I hope you've all realized that by now. So uh, first, let me talk about Azure. So Chef works with any cloud provider. Uh, we'll work with AWS. We work with Azure. In fact, we're pretty good partners with Microsoft. So on, on AWS and on Azure both, you can go into their marketplace and you can get an image that is a Chef server. So one click, install the Chef server, now you're running Chef server in your Azure. Uh, and now I can automate everything to do with Azure all through Chef. So uh, just like we could do with, uh, with AWS, we can do the same with Azure, with DigitalOcean, with Rackspace, with I don't know what other cloud provider you might mention. I'm sure we have an integration with them. So yes, Azure is not a problem. Now, the other question is much more difficult for me to answer. Uh, how do I get a customer who says, man, we hate to deploy, once a year is about good. That's, that's kind of the pace we want. You should keep working on new features, but I don't want to see them until next December. <laughs> like, so um, that's, it's, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing, right? And so you have to kind of really start to dig into why? Why is that? Why do they want to only release once a year? Because the previous uh, previous uh, development software uh, company was very bad. Yeah. It's a good thing because now we look really great. <laughs> right. They are scared. Right. So the previous company set a really low bar. Yeah. Exactly. And it's super easy for you to just you just leap over that bar every day. Right. Yeah. So what I the other thing you could do is work for a month and then collect a paycheck for the 11 more months, and then in December deploy everything, and they'll be happy. Like That's another great piece of advice. You can scale out the number of customers you have. If you could get them all to do that, you could have 12x the customers that you have today. What do you think? I think that's pretty good. So also maybe not right. So the, I think that the way that you convince them is you, you sit down and you have an open conversation with them. You say, look, th these deployments, of course you don't want to do them anymore. They were terrible. They were hard. They were stressful things. They, or when they worked, they were things that you threw an office party about. Like, oh my gosh, the deploy went off without a hitch. I'm buying everyone a round of beers. We're having cake, whatever. So the, the way that you can convince them uh, is get permission to do one small change. One small change. Roll it out. You have to show them. And maybe the way that you get that is, I, of course, I know nothing about this customer or what you're doing with but maybe the way you get them to do that is with another little application that's over here on the side that you're just experimenting with. Like maybe the main thing that they care about is something that they really, really care about and they're afraid to touch. I get it. We've all been there. Is there a, another a side project, something over here, something that's not so that they're not so scared about that you can show them? Look, we can do this in a repeatable way. The other thing that you could do is. You could start doing continuous delivery to a test or QA environment, and you could show them, look, every week I'm deploying, every day I'm deploying changes to this QA environment. Every day it stays up. Start monitoring it just like you do production. Show them the graphs. Show them, look, we're introducing changes. We're, we're having no impact on the site. You bet. All right, well, thank you all again for coming out. Um, I'm, I don't think we have to leave. You should, you should get to talk to other people while you're here. The beauty of a meetup is not to come and listen to the person up front. It's to talk amongst yourselves and get to meet new faces tonight. So thanks again for having me.